It is a privilege to be with you uh, this evening. It is a great crowd that has come out this evening. And I just want to thank you. This is a very, very important subject. But I, I hope you're here as a Christian. If you are here as a Christian, uh, if, if you're here as a Muslim, you're very welcome. I hope that you will hear an accurate um, and uh, respectful presentation on my part, or I am seeking to accurately represent what has been taught historically and believed historically uh, by Muslims down through the centuries. But if you're here as a Christian this evening, um, I hope that you're here first and foremost as a disciple of him who is the truth. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that means we have a standard that we have to hold to in how we deal with our beliefs, but also how we deal with the beliefs of others. Uh, over the course of the past uh, 21 years, starting in August of 1990, I've had the opportunity of engaging in, as of last Friday night in Brisbane, Australia, 111 moderated public debates. During that course of time, I hopefully have learned a lot. I've lost a lot of hair, as some of you have noticed uh, during that time. But I hopefully have learned a lot. But hopefully I started that first debate in August of 1990 with a man named Jerry Matitix in the same way that I, I per, uh, pursued the debates that I did with Abdullah Kunda at the University of New South Wales last Monday evening um, and with a man by the name of Roger Perkins in Brisbane, Australia on Friday evening. And that is seeking to accurately represent what they believed and to respond to it in such a way that even though I know there are certain emotional arguments I could have used that might have been more uh, impactful I refuse to use them because we must use the same standards that we have in the defense of our faith that we also use in the criticism of somebody else's. If we're going to point the figure at someone else, we realize there are three fingers pointing back toward us. And one of the great concerns I have today is that there has become a cottage industry in evangelicalism talking about Islam and basically frightening Christians about the subject of Islam. There are many things to be concerned about. Uh, I am very concerned about radical extremist Shiites in Islam with nuclear weapons. Any rational person would have to be concerned about something like that. And we all saw what happened on 9-11. But we at the same time need to recognize that there are over a billion Muslims in the world and if all of them were flying planes into buildings, there wouldn't be many buildings left. And so there has to be an understanding on our part. We have to be truthful and seek to be truthful in how we address anything. And especially in this area, I am concerned that there is such uh, fear on the part of some Christians that even if an opportunity to witness to a Muslim were to arise, there would be a paralyzing fear that would keep us from proclaiming the gospel to dear people who need to know about the true and living Lord Jesus Christ. And hopefully over the next two evenings, uh, I'll be able to give you a foundation in an understanding of where Islam is coming from and hopefully as a result encourage you to open up opportunities of dialogue with those you might have opportunity of witnessing to. I hope that that is uh, what will happen. Now these are images that you and I see on a regular basis. If you watch uh, any of the news outlets, though uh, some are more uh, willing to discuss these things than others, we know that uh, there is a movement in the world. Uh, if you go over to the United Kingdom, as I do fairly regularly, and engage in debates and dialogues over there, uh, you know that there is, in any uh, Western nation today, uh, a growing Muslim subpopulation and certain elements of that population are very open in saying, for example, you see on the screen, Islam will dominate the world. And of course, we know that uh, from the Islamic perspective, there is something given by God called the Sharia, the Sharia is, is a legal system based upon the Quran and the Hadith, the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. And it is an entire way of life. 
It is, it is not just guidelines like we would have in Christianity as to how to live in a godly fashion, no. Uh, the Sharia goes to, to, to describe every aspect of life to order it and to guide it. And from the Islamic perspective, since that's a revelation from God, until we are subject to that, we will never truly experience happiness. And that uh, the day will come when that law will predominate all over the world. Now, of course, as Christians, we also believe that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Now, how that is brought about and what that means to the individual who then submits to that, that is one of the major differences between Christianity and Islam. But to understand why there would be people like this, and yet to also understand why it is that if this is all we know of Islam, if this is the only face of Islam we know, the vast majority of us will never take the time to present the gospel. Because I, I've, I've tried to talk to folks like that. And very often they're not willing to hear and if, I'm, if I try to talk to folks like that, you say, well, yeah, but you've, you've debated with Muslims all over the place, and you've, you've studied the Quran and, and the Hadith, and, and you've got all this background, and you find them next to impossible to talk to. Why should I even bother? That's not the only face of Islam there is. You can address many, many Muslim people who uh, not only would be great neighbors of yours, but who have great respect for prophets, respect for Jesus. Many, at least especially that haven't been deeply infected by westernized Islam, uh, might even have a very high respect for the Bible and what the Bible has to say, even though very few of them have much knowledge of what is actually contained in the Bible. I keep in mind, when I look at images like this, an interview I did with a man who was born on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's not a really good place to go if you're going to be, if you want to be exposed to Christianity, if you know what I mean. And years before he was born, a missionary came through his town and left a New Testament with his parents. Why his parents kept the New Testament, he does not know to this day. But when he became old enough to read, they made the common parental mistake. They said, don't read this book. <laughs> You would think that all of us would figure out that's not the way to do it. And of course, having been told not to read that book, what did he do? He read that book. And in a glorious act of God's grace, this young man came to know the Savior that walked the pages of that New Testament. And he gave testimony of how vastly different the Jesus of the New Testament was from the Jesus of Islam, and that is true. You can read every word that the Quran says about Isa bin Maryam. The name for Jesus in the Quran is Isa. That's not really an appropriate translation of the name Jesus, but that's what's there. And you can read everything the Quran says about Isa bin Maryam, and you will never find a living person in those words. The Jesus of the Quran is an argument, not a person. And I would say it's impossible to love him. But the Jesus of Mark and the Jesus of John, and the Jesus of Luke and Matthew is a living, powerful person, as most of us here can testify to. And so getting someone to read about that Jesus, introducing them in our own words, in our own gospel witness, that's the balance to what we see in images like this, or images like this. This is June 30th, 2007. This is the Glasgow Airport in Scotland. When I first saw these images, I immediately got on my phone and tried to start remembering how to dial internationally because I have friends in Glasgow. I have had the privilege of ministering in the Reformed Baptist Church of Annie's Land a number of times. Jim Handyside and his wife Chrissy are good friends of mine, and, and I know that Jim goes through this airport. I have walked through the doorway. I have stood at those gates that people are running from right now. And so when you see a place under attack that you yourself know, it, it, it sticks in your memory. I was in the Twin Towers only a year before they fell. And the 
car that you see on fire right there, a Jeep Cherokee or Commander, one of those type of vehicles, that drove in. Uh, the intention of the two men inside it, it was filled with gasoline, was to create a huge fireball that would have engulfed all those people at the gates, uh, at the, at the check-in counters, and to do massive damage and, and, and a horrific way of, of killing people. Now, most of, you, most of you probably don't know who those men were. There wasn't much discussion of, uh, of their backgrounds and things like that. Most people think, well, they must have just been, you know, some poor radicals from a faraway country that didn't have anything better to live for. The reality is they were national health care doctors, both of them, trained medical professionals who purposely, they did die, they did not die immediately, they died of their burns later, but they died for what reason? Political reasons? Yes, no question about it. Islam is a religio-political system or a politico-religious system depending on whether it's in the small minority or when it becomes, starts moving toward the majority. You cannot separate the political aspects from Islam. Uh, to do so radically alters its historical character. There's no question that far, in, 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 a, in a much more intimate way, Islam is politically oriented than Christianity ever could be. And in fact, the, the times when Christianity has become united with political power have been times of perversion of the faith, not a natural outgrowth of the faith, but Islam from its earliest points in time has been intimately connected with political systems. But there's another reason. There's a theological reason for why that car is on fire in that still shot now upon the screen. And I'm afraid that many people in our society don't understand those reasons. I'm afraid there are many secularists who are in governmental positions that don't understand those theological reasons. Now we'll get to the real theological reasons tomorrow evening. But tonight we need to get to the background, the history. And so I hope to make this as, I'm not going to use the term entertaining for you. I'm going to ask you to do some work with me this evening. But what is, let me give you the goal uh, so that you know what, when we get there. Uh, why it's worthwhile that you work with me over the course of the next hour or so. We all have to face the issue of Islam. If you turn on your television every single day, you are, you are faced with the reality of Islam in our world today. Whether it be the antipathy of the nations around Israel for the existence of this tiny little nation and the religious background of the Palestinian conflict, we hear about Iran constantly, what's going on with the Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we as Christians, if we want to think in a, with a Christian worldview, one of the first thoughts across our mind should be, what do these people believe? Why are they acting the way that they're acting? What is the motivation? Why are there differences amongst them? Why are the Shiites blowing up the Sunnis? Why are the Sunnis blowing up the Shiites? Why are they both blowing up the Ahmadi? If we're Christians, we want to have an understanding of why that is and where they're coming from. And hence, to be able to respond to what's going on in our world in a, in a way that honors our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's my goal. Now, part of that will also be to encourage you to be involved in presenting the gospel with clarity to the Muslims that you might encounter. But that's my goal. And I think that's worth working toward with me. So we'll have some historical material to work with. You may have heard some of these things. You may have heard other things that aren't overly accurate, unfortunately. But we need to understand where this faith came from and why people believe what they believe. Now, Mecca at the beginning of the 7th century AD, please realize Islam historically comes after Christianity and hence the Quran. And I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to pass this around. I'm going to ask maybe Eddie if you can keep an eye on this so that I get it back. <laughs> I've never lost it, but I've come close. Uh, I want to pass around the room. I'm not sure how this is going to work because we have so many sections, but you all figure it out. Um, I want to pass around an Arabic Quran um, so that you can see what it looks like, see what the pages look like. Please note that as you look at it, uh, there are no notes 
at the bottom of the page. That's something that I'm going to bring up a little bit later on in the lecture. Um, but this is the standard 1924 Egyptian printing. This would be the Quran that most Muslims would have today uh, if they read Arabic. The vast majority of the world's Muslims do not read Arabic, actually. This is the only form in which the Quran exists. Any translation you read is not even from the Islamic perspective of the real Quran, even though most Muslims are dependent upon translations. The Quran exists only in Arabic and from the, Quranic, and from the Islamic perspective has eternally existed in Arabic. It is not a created thing. Uh, which gives you some idea of what they believe as to its authority. So why don't you grab me my water and I'll hand you that because uh, uh, as I said, I just got back from Australia. I've been speaking pretty much non-stop since the 11th of October and every once in a while I may have to do this. Thank you. Mecca is a city that today um, almost no one in this room could ever visit unless you're a Muslim. Uh, Non-Muslims are not allowed in the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia today. Such certainly was not the case at uh, the beginning of the 7th century when Islam arose there uh, under the teachings of a man by the name of Muhammad. Now, it is a town out in the middle of nowhere in a desert and therefore it requires uh, caravan trade uh, to be able to sustain itself uh, because they simply cannot provide the, the, the food uh, that, they, that they need. And so there were caravan trade going many different directions, but uh, especially up into Christianized Syria. And a young man by the name of Muhammad was involved in those caravan trades and hence would have had exposure at some point in time uh, to the Christian faith, probably only from talking to Christians. Maybe there might have been some Christians in the caravans, or maybe some, some priests that you would speak to uh, in, a, in a town or a village. Uh, also would have had exposure to Judaism and uh, to Jews as well at that point in time. This man uh, eventually uh, became known, at least according to Islamic sources, as an honest man. And he had some facility in trading. He married an older woman, Khadijah, uh, who was fairly well off. And she put him in charge of her materials. And uh, once he had the freedom to do so, he, he, he began to become somewhat contemplative. And he would take time where he would go into a, a cave and he would just spend time alone contemplating uh, the world and what was going on. Now he lived in a polytheistic society. Mecca, its primary attraction was a building called the Kaaba. And the Kaaba, by some stories, contained 360 idols. And so many of the tribes, the Arabian tribes, would have particular attachments to particular of these gods. And they would make pilgrimage to Mecca. This was very important to the Meccan economy. Especially the period of time where you would go on Hajj, where you would, you would come and you would visit the shrine in Mecca and that's when many of the sales would take place and much of the income of Mecca was generated. And uh, the, the, the pagans would, would walk around uh, the, the, the shrine there in Mecca and uh, sometimes unclothed and would do their various forms of worship to these many, many gods. And this was the Mecca in which Muhammad lived. His tribe uh, was in charge of many of these things and hence was very politically uh, connected. According to Islamic understandings, according to the stories in the Hadith, which is a collection of the sayings and actions of Muhammad that were put together 200, 250 years after the time of Muhammad, uh, there are different authoritative collections of these, Sahih al-Bakari, Sahih al-Muslim, Jamia Termini, etc., etc. Um, during one of these times of contemplation, an angel appeared to Muhammad. Now, after this is over, Muhammad goes back to Khadijah and he is convinced that he is under the attack of jinn. Now, the Arabs believe that jinn, well, you know, genies, uh, please do not go to the 1960s uh, TV show for your uh, theology at this point, though there are connections. Um, but the jinn are made of, of smokeless fire, 
and uh, they are, they almost, they, they, in, in modern Islamic belief, many conservative Muslims anyways, um, it's almost a parallel universe. Jinn are um, faster than we are, they're more powerful than we are, but they're not as smart as we are. Well, that'd be a dangerous combination. <laughs> Think of all the trouble we get into and, and we're not all that smart uh, and we're slow and weak evidently from their perspective. Um, but there are Muslim jinn, there are Christian jinn, there are um, a Jewish jinn. It, it's, it's a whole parallel universe. It's, it's very, very interesting. And Muhammad believed that he was under attack from a jinn when this initially took place. But an angel comes to him and he says, recite or read. And Muhammad says, I cannot. And the, the angel squeezes him until he thinks he's going to die. And he, this, this happens a number of times. And then the first portion of the Quran is given to him in these words from Surah 96. Proclaim or read in the name of thy Lord and cherisher who created, created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Proclaim and thy Lord is most bountiful. He who taught the use of the pen taught man that which he knew not. This was the first uh, revelation that is found in the Quran. But now please note something. That's Surah 96. Uh, that means that this, the Quran is not written in order. And we get to the Quran, that's going to be a very important thing to keep in mind in trying to understand exactly what it is. And so this first revelation comes to him and what, what it accompanies is a call to monotheism. Now think about it. If Mecca is based upon the, the trade of people coming to the idols... How popular are you going to be? Especially when you're part of the tribe that makes the most money off the idol trade. If you start preaching, um, those are all just idols, they don't have any real existence, and we need to worship one God, Allah. You're not going to be very popular. And in fact, you might find yourself, if you start making converts, to be in great danger. So from 610, when the event in the cave takes place, 610 A.D., to 622 is called the Meccan period. And Muhammad is a minority prophet in Mecca. He is frequently reviled. He is persecuted. His followers are persecuted as well, beaten. Uh, some are killed. And his message is fairly straightforward. There is one God, creator of heaven and earth. Very similar to what you would have in the prophets Constantly warning the people of Israel, the Baals are no true gods. There's only one God who created the heavens and the earth. There are a number of, of passages that use very similar language in these sections of the Quran. And of course, since he's a minority prophet at this time, this is also where you get the stuff about, well, there should be no compulsion in religion. There should be freedom of religion in that sense. Because, well, when you're the minority prophet, you want to have freedom of religion. And that's very important to keep in mind, especially as the Quran enters into modern discussions of freedom of religion and the fact that in Islamic countries, that's what you don't have, is freedom of religion at that time. So he's a minority prophet from 610 to 622. Then you have the Hijra in 622, the, uh, the, the exodus in essence of Muhammad and his followers. There had been a brief move to Abyssinia by some, but, but Muhammad and his followers go to a, a town called Yathrib. It is renamed to Medina, the city of the prophet. And this is a huge change in Muhammad's life. He's only going to live to 632, so he only has 10 more years. But these last 10 years are extremely important. In fact, when you look at the surahs of the Quran, they're divided into the Meccan period and the Medinan period. What changes? Well, as soon as he arrives, he in essence is in charge. Now, it takes him a few years to really consolidate that because there are a number of Jewish tribes in Medina and things like that, but they are united together by the attacks of the Meccans. And so warfare brings them together. So now he's no longer a minority prophet just seeking to survive. When he was in Mecca during that period of time, if his uncle, Abu Talib, had not protected him, he, 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 he probably would have been killed. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting, just for your information, um, 
Muhammad prayed to Allah to ask for the right to pray for his parents. And Allah would not allow him to pray for his parents who had died because they had died as polytheists. In Islam, the worst sin that you can commit, the only sin that you can commit that if you die upon that sin, Allah will never forgive you, is the sin of shirk. If you commit shirk, if you are one who is living in that lifestyle, then you are one of the mushrikim, you're a mushrik. And uh, Muhammad's parents had died as mushriks. And Muhammad was not allowed to pray for his parents. He did everything in his power to get Abu Talib, his uncle, to convert. To say, La ilaha illallah, there is one God, Allah, who is worthy to be worshipped. Uh, we'll talk about the Shahada, uh, the, the, the way you become a Muslim. Uh, we'll go into the theology more tomorrow evening. But he tried everything in his power, even on his deathbed, trying to convince him to say those words. But Abu Talib would not. And he died as a mushrik. And Muhammad was given, has been given two forms of intercession. He will intercede for all of his people on the final day and remove them from the hellfire. Well, again, we'll try to get that tomorrow night. But he was given one extremely unusual intercession. And that is he was allowed to pray for Abu Talib. And as a result, Abu Talib, well, the best way to put it, has the best spot in hell. He has the best spot in hell. He has the place of least punishment in hell. And uh, you might be sitting there wondering, well, what is the best, what is the garden spot of, of the fire, by the way? Uh, what does that look like? And according to the Hadith sources, uh, Abu Talib, there's, it's put two ways. Either he's wearing sandals of flame or he's standing in flame up to his ankles. Those are the two different ways. If any of you have ever, any of you ever read any of the Hadith? Any of you familiar with the Hadith? <laughs> hey, good, found you. All right. Uh, um, very few people have read the, any of the Hadith. Uh, and if you have, the, the stories are repeated over and over again, and there will be subtle variations between how the, the various Hadith are recorded. <coughs> Excuse me. But he's wearing sandals of flame that are so hot that his brains are boiling. That's the best spot in the fire, is to wear sandals that are so hot that your brains are boiling. But uh, that's, that's the result of uh, Muhammad's intercession for Abu Talib. Um, I'm not sure exactly why I shared that with you. I just have always found it to be a fascinating story. <coughs> Excuse me. So Muhammad goes to Medina. <coughs> he is now the prophet of Islam. And now you start finding all of those sections of the Quran that start talking about obedience to the prophet, not rebelling against the prophet. You have much more. Now Mecca starts sending armies against Medina. Uh, and in fact, I think I have here uh, some of the, uh, yeah, the Battle of Badr in 624, the Battle of Uhud in 625, the Battle of the Trench in 627. And so now Muhammad is... Uh, the head of raiding caravans. He's, he's raiding caravans from Mecca. He is at the head of an army. Um, and this is a completely different realm. And you start hearing a lot about jihad. And jihad can mean interior personal struggle in the Quran. There's no reason to deny that because that's there. But it also means exterior military battle with the sword against the enemies of Islam and this becomes extremely important during this period of time. In the Battle of Badr, the Meccans really didn't expect to run into much in the way of, of resistance and they were, they were defeated badly. But then at the Battle of Uhud, the, uh, again, a much larger army coming against a smaller army. The Muslims are doing real well but then there's a breakdown in discipline and basically the Muslims lose, even though the Meccans do not pursue them into uh, the city itself, which uh, you know, changes things. Uh, but uh, that then results in a, a, a situation uh, hmm, where the wireless network goes down and leaves you completely stranded and uh, <laughs> unable to control your computer down there. Um, 
that leads, leads to a situation where there are revelations about the unfaithfulness of the people. That was the reason why they, uh, why they you know, lost the battle and things like that. And then the Battle of the Trench, it's, it's, it's sort of more like a, a standoff that takes place. But during all this time, Muhammad's growing and growing in power and in, in strength. And uh, in fact, during this period of time, there are some, uh, I think, very, very important uh, situations. The, the Banu Kareza are a Jewish tribe that after the battle, one of the battles, Muhammad determined that they were treacherous to him. And uh, he laid siege. This is, these were people in Medina. He laid siege to their homes and uh, brought all the men out and beheaded all of them about 800 men, uh, and their women and children were enslaved. Now, Muslim apologists have answers for all of these things. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that in the Islamic world, Muhammad, in many ways, in many ways, takes the place of Christ in Christianity. He really does. I mean, there are people who try to resist that, but there is no mediator in Islamic theology. It's one of the key issues I get to tomorrow night. And Muhammad is viewed as, is frequently exalted to a tremendously high place, to where he is considered to be the best of all men. And it's important for us in analyzing where he was in history, who he was, and the fact that from the Islamic perspective, he becomes the example that we are to follow. This is important in the modern day debates regarding the appropriate activities and behaviors of the Islamic world. Because many people look back at Muhammad and they see these actions and if he is the, if he is the best man who has ever lived, if he is the example for us, more so than Jesus, he's only the Jewish Messiah. He wasn't meant to be an example for all the rest of us. If that's the case, then can we not look at what he did with the Banu Qureza? Can we not look at the fact that he uh, the, one of the things back then, one of the main ways to attack a political rival was with poetry. Now that's not exact. Now we use YouTube. Um, you know, have we really progressed all that far? I'm not sure. But uh, back then, uh, uh, someone who wrote poetry against you was a, was a very dangerous enemy. Muhammad had people who criticized him via poetry killed. He, he approved the fact that there was a woman, an old woman, who had written against him. And he approved the fact that some of his followers went and brutally murdered her. That was a good thing to do. And as Islamic apologists will say, that was a political act. No different than what we just did to the man in Yemen. They'll argue that way. We need to understand this so that we can be thinking about the character of Muhammad and to try to do so fairly in the context in which he lived, but also to recognize there are many Muslims who put him up as the standard of behavior, and these things did take place. These are not disputable things. Are, these are things that are part of the Islamic sources themselves. Finally, in 628, uh, Muhammad and a, a large force marches to Mecca, and he wants to go to Hajj. And the Meccans come out and say, we can't let you do that. However, um, let's, sort of, let's sort of have a truce because the Meccans had now realized that Muhammad was a force to be dealed with. This, this truce lasted for two years and finally in 630, uh, the Muslims march into Mecca basically unopposed and, uh, and take over the city and clean out the Kaaba. Uh, and uh, it becomes the... Um, obviously the very center of things, even though Muhammad goes back to Medina, he, and he, in fact he dies in, in Medina, and, and the, the, the relationship of Mecca and Medina is still sort of the heart of Islam uh, to this very day. Uh, two years later, in 632, uh, Muhammad dies in Medina and is uh, buried there. Um, most Muslims believe that if you were to open his uh, grave today, you would see him exactly as he died because prophets' bodies do not decay. Uh, in fact, my, uh, my Muslim opponent in, uh, in Australia surprised me uh, Monday evening, a week ago Monday evening, uh, by asserting that he believed that Muhammad was completely sinless 
And I found that oddly strange because the Quran talks about the sins of, of, uh, of Muhammad and uh, the Hadith record his being forgiven of sins. So I didn't have an opportunity to pursue that with him, but uh, there are all sorts of amazing uh, beliefs concerning uh, Muhammad. Now, let's uh, look at the clock and pick up the pace here. Just two key theological events in the life of Muhammad that I think are... Uh, there are many that I could have chosen. Uh, I chose these two. Muhammad and Zainab bin Josh. Um, Zainab bin Josh was married to Muhammad's adopted son, Zaid. And from all the, and I've read, I think I've worked through pretty much all the Hadith sources on this particular incident. Um, from all that I've read, um, Zainab was gorgeous. I mean, just one of those women that you, you just go, whoa. Uh, there are just some ladies like that, and evidently that's what Zainab was like. And according to the stories, uh, one day Muhammad uh, came by Zaid's house, and she answered the door, and she wasn't wearing her hijab. And the sources don't say what Muhammad said, but it's pretty obvious that Muhammad went, wow. Well, she knows that Muhammad went, wow. And he's the prophet. And to be one of the prophet's wives is to have a pretty high position in that society. And so this leads to problems. Some people feel that, you know, Zainab, uh, you know, as a result, sort of became difficult to live with. And, and Zaid actually came to Muhammad when he heard about this and said, would you like me to divorce my wife so that you may marry her? Muhammad says, no, 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 no. no, no don't, don't do that. Stay with her. Well, that doesn't work out that way. And uh, Zaid uh, divorces Zainab. And a revelation comes to Muhammad. Now, he's receiving portions of the Quran from 610 onwards all the way uh, to the end of his prophetic time. And, and what would happen, basically, is people would come with questions, and sometimes the answer would come quickly, sometimes the answer would take quite some time. But he would go into various forms. Sometimes he would wrap himself in a, in a blanket. Uh, sometimes there would, there's different ways in which he manifested this receiving of revelation, but he would receive direct revelation that would end up in the Quran. And, uh, oh, I, I, thought I, had, I thought I had included the quote here. Let me just look one, one place and see if I, if I did. Yes, I did uh, include it. I just need to fix one of those screens there. And this is what came um, to Muhammad. Behold, thou didst say to one who had received the grace of Allah and thy favor, Reta retain thou in wedlock thy wife and fear Allah. That's what he said to his adopted son, Zaid. But thou didst hide in thy heart that which Allah was about to make manifest. Thou didst fear the people, but it is more fitting that thou shouldest fear Allah. Then when Zaid had dissolved his marriage with her with the necessity, necessary formality, we joined her in marriage to thee, in order that in future there may be no difficulty to the believers in the matter of marriage with the wives of their adopted sons, when the latter have dissolved with the necessary formality their marriage with them, and Allah's command must be fulfilled, Surah 33, 37. So, here you have a situation where Muhammad clearly desires this woman. But you see, the standard belief of the Arabs was you could not marry the divorced wife of an adopted child. And so not only does a, does a revelation come from Allah making this possible, and by the way, Everybody else could only have four wives. Muhammad was allowed to have more than that. He was given a special dispensation via revelation as well. But what's more, and this, is, this has had extensive, extensive impact upon Islamic society ever since this time. Because of what happened with Zainab, the beginning of Surah 33 basically does away with adoption in Islamic culture. 
Because you see, Zaid had been called Zaid bin Muhammad, the son of Muhammad. But to make this work, now he was to be t called by his natural father's name, even if he had never met him, if he, had, he, was a, he was an orphan. And in essence, the whole concept of, which we have as Christians, I mean, what's one of the most beautiful pictures of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ in the scriptures? Adoption. In Roman adoption, when you're adopted under Roman law, you have all of the legal rights of a natural born child. You could not be treated as a second class citizen. That was destroyed. That was done away with in the situation that arose because of what happened with Zainab bin Jash. And uh, it has had massive impact upon um, the world ever since then. There was then also a, a deputation from Najran uh, right toward the end, I think it was 631, right toward the end of Muhammad's life, Najran was a, a city that was Christian, had its own bishop, had its own church. Sadly, um, after Muhammad's death, uh, they were all basically kicked out of um, Saudi Arabia because the Islamic idea was there could be no non-Muslims living in the Arabian Peninsula. But they sent a deposition to Muhammad and they said, we, we understand that you have beliefs about Jesus. We want to know what you believe about Jesus. We, we, want, to, we want to know if, if we can, you know, where you're coming from and how we can have a relationship with you. This is part of what was revealed now realize, notice the, I'm not sure if you can see the number there, but yeah, 359.61. So this is at the end of Muhammad's life, yeah, it's in the third, th third surah. So as you can see, uh, the, the Quran is, is constructed in that way. Notice what came down from heaven in response to these uh, Christians, according to the Quran. Indeed, the example of Jesus to Allah is like that of Adam. He created him from dust, then he said to him, be, and he was. The truth is from your Lord, so do not be among the doubters. Then whoever argues with you about it, after this knowledge has come to you, say, Come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves. Then supplicate earnestly together and invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars among us. Indeed, this is the true narration, and there is no deity except Allah. And indeed, Allah is the exalted in might, the wise. But if they turn away, then indeed, Allah is knowing of the corruptors. Say, O people of the scripture, al al kitab that's Christians and Jews. In this context, it would be specifically Christians. Come to a word that is equitable between us and you, that we will not worship except Allah, and not associate anything with him, that's called shirk, and not take one another as lords instead of Allah. But if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we are Muslims submitting to him. This is the first of these encounters that are going to be taking place all the way up till, well, the last one I know of was when I debated Abdullah Kunda in Sydney a week ago, Monday night. Christians and Muslims talking about what they believe, and especially talking about who Jesus is. My debate with Abdullah Kunda was on the incarnation, can God become a man? Uh, which was the first debate I'd ever heard on that subject, actually. And that's why I'd suggested that particular uh, direction. But this is the first of the events to take place, and it took place all the way back during the time of Muhammad's life. Now, uh, where is the, uh, the Quran right now? Or is who's, who's got it there? There it is, okay. We'll make sure that's, uh, that's going around. I want everybody to get a chance to see that. Just look at it briefly and move it around. There are 114 surahs in the Quran. Those are roughly chapters, even though uh, they differ in length. The second surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, the cow, is the longest surah in the Quran. It has hundreds of ayah or verses in it. The first surah, Surah Al-Fatiha, is just an opening prayer uh, of just a few verses that is a part of all the Islamic prayers. And then Surah 2 is the longest, Surah 3 is the next longest, Surah 4, etc., etc. So basically it's organized by size. Well, the problem is, if you go out and buy the Quran, 
as all the reporters from CNN did after the 9-11 attacks. And they're, <clears throat> they're standing there outside the Barnes and Noble, thumbing through the Quran, trying to find something to add to their, their news report to set them aside from everybody else. And they can't make heads or tails out of it. It's just a bunch of stuff about one God and, uh, you know, don't do this to camels. And, you know, and they, they can't make heads or tails out of it. Part of the reason is, if you try to sit down and read from Surah Al-Fatiha all the way through Surah 114, you're bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between the Mecca and Medinan periods. And without the assistance of the Hadith, and this is assuming that the Hadith sources are actually accurate, that's a whole nother story we can't get into tonight. But without the assistance of the Hadith, you have no idea what the backgrounds are. Can you imagine what it'd be like to preach, I, I frequently use the example of preaching through Corinthians. I'm preaching through Hebrews right now, but Corinthians gives us a little bit of a better example, I think. What would it be like to try to preach through Paul's epistles to the Corinthians if we have no earthly idea what Corinth was like? We have no earthly idea what was going on. We don't know what the issues were. We don't know what their religious worship was. We don't know much about their language, their culture. We know very little about who Paul is and almost nothing about who he's writing to. Can you imagine how, how much less in-depth a commentary on 1st and 2nd Corinthians would be if that was the situation we're facing? Well, that's what you have with the vast majority of the Quran. You don't have that kind of background information. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. It's a very, very difficult book to address because of that. And very few in the Islamic world, there are people primarily in the West, ironically not so much in Islamic countries, but primarily in the West who attempt to do that kind of thing. There's all sorts of in-depth literature, very expensive literature. But still, it's extremely unusual for most imams to do any kind of in-depth exegesis of the text of the Quran at all. It's organized by size, not chronology or topic. I should have put these up here before. I told you these things very difficult to follow context and background dependent upon the Hadith stories themselves. Now, as I mentioned before, the Muslim believes that what you have in the Quran are the direct words of God, not of men. There is a fundamental difference in how we view inspiration between Christians and Muslims. I'm assuming that most here are conservative Christians and hence you would uh, believe with me what Paul says to Timothy, that all scripture is theanustos, it is God-breathed. We believe that it is, it is the very voice of God, yes. But that as Peter said, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so we don't have any problem with Paul writing to Timothy and saying, bring the cloak and the parchments. The cloak, because I'm cold in this Roman prison, and the parchments, because I want to write more letters. But you see, the Muslim looks at that and goes, that can't be the word of God. God doesn't need a cloak, and he doesn't need parchments. There cannot be any admixture. Now, of course, we're not saying it's admixture. We're saying God used men. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But that's where we have a major difference in our understanding. And so from their perspective, what you have in the Quran are the very words of God. They are not words of men. And that means they are not the words of Muhammad. Now we can look at the Quran and the vast majority of scholars look at the Quran and go, this represents a 7th century understanding of certain things, but the Muslim has to say, no, there is no aspect of Muhammad's understanding whatsoever to be found in the Quran, anywhere. Now, Muslims believe that many books have been natsal, they have been sent down from God. In fact, the Quran teaches that the Torah, the law, and the Injil, the gospel, have been sent down by God and they contain light and guidance and we are told to judge by what is contained in those books. Surah 5, 44 through 47. So there are many books that have been sent down but the last book that has been sent down is the Quran and it acts as a guard, a guard, a mohaimen over the preceding books. It, it, it 
from the, I could show you a clip, but I, I didn't put it in here because I didn't think we'd have time for it. But when I asked Shabir Ali, who's probably considered to be the leading Islamic apologist, I asked him to debate in 2006 at Biola, how can we know what's still inspired in the New Testament and what isn't? And his response was, if it agrees with the Quran, it's still inspired. If it doesn't, it isn't. And so you, you have a situation where the Muslim is looking back upon our scriptures through the lens of the Quran. And it becomes what, do, what determines what is and what is not true. Now that's, a, that's anachronistic. It's looking backwards. Because from our perspective, hey, you guys are the new kids on the block. You, you, come six, you come over half a millennium after us. Shouldn't we be judging your revelation by what's in ours? But you see, from their perspective, that's not the case. They've been, along, they've been here all the time. All of the prophets were Muslims. All the prophets were Muslims. Jesus was a Muslim. The disciples were Muslims. Uh, Abraham was a Muslim. Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba, according to Islamic sources. Now, historically, I don't think there's the slightest bit of evidence of that, but that's the Islamic belief. And so, Islam's been here all along. Then there was a, pe a period of the, the Jahiliya, the period of ignorance, uh, where uh, they started worshipping other deities and things like that. Muhammad comes back, restores it. To, Muhammad comes and restores it to its, its pristine originality, etc., etc. But, but the point is that they've always, Islam's been around. And that's how they get around the problem that, in essence, we need to be looking at them and examining them in a, in a different way. That's how they, that's how they do that. Uh, okay, Eddie, could you pull the, could you pull the um, uh, batteries out of the clock? Uh, because it's going way too fast. Uh, way, way, way too fast. Um, actually, in Australia, I've got about 12 hours to go before we have to wrap up. And nobody told me what time, you know, time zone I was supposed to be doing things. Um, the text of the Quran. I'm going to show you some things over the next 15 minutes. That 99.999997% of all Muslims in the world have never seen. I presented this material in a debate in uh, Queens about two years ago in a debate with Imam Shamsi Ali. We were in this huge Presbyterian church, but it was a really liberal Presbyterian church, so there hadn't been more than 20 Presbyterians in this church at one time for about 50 years. That's what liberalism does to you. Beautiful church. Seated a thousand people, standing room only, and 800 of them were Muslims. And when I got to this point where I started showing some of the stuff I'm going to show you, it was the deer in the headlight thing. What are you talking about? I'd never seen anything like this before. Have I woken you up now? Good, good. The, the Muslim believes, remember the Quran is probably still over here someplace, right? Has it moved over here yet? Okay, it's slowly moving. It may get over to here tomorrow night. <laughs> I need to start carrying more than one of those. But I, you know one of the reasons I don't carry more than one Arabic Quran? You know how many times I have found a we inspected your bag TSA thing inside my Arabic Quran? I think someone's trying to give me a message. And I feel like going in there and saying, dudes, I'm the Christian. And like, but they, didn't, they don't get that message. Um, the Muslim believes that that Quran is exactly what Muhammad dictated as the Quran came down. And they look at us and they go, oh, okay, how many of you have the ESV? Come on, how many of you have the ESV? How many have the NIV? How many of you have the New American Standard? How many have the King James? How many have the New King James? How many have the NRSV? How many have the Living Bible? Don't put your hands up. <laughs> That was a trick. We will have intervention counseling with you afterwards if you put your hand up for that one. And they look at that and they go, Word of God? How can you have the Word of God if you've got all these different versions of it? And not only that, those of you who have the ESV and the NIV, okay, let me just do one thing to you here. Who, who has the ESV? Put your hand up. Who, who has one with you? 
You have one right there? Sitting on the front row. Okay. Would you please read for me, sir, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 4. Everybody has your Bible. If you have a Bible, look it up. John chapter 5, verse 4 in the ESV or the NIV, either one of them. Could you read for me the fourth verse of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John? Yeah, good luck. There is no fourth verse. It goes from three to five. That's not a typo. It's not a typo. Um, if you're like me and you're past 40 and tiny footnotes now look like smudges of dirt on the page rather than footnotes, you might look down at the bottom of the page. You'll find it. But it's not there anymore. And you see, the Muslim looks at those little footnotes at the bottom of the page that say some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that. And they say, we have the perfectly preserved Quran. And all you have is that. Got your attention now? Good. Why? Well, the Quran was basically, <laughs> it's basically a government production. The Quran was controlled. There's a Quran right up front. Uh, and there you go, sir. It had a government controlled textual transmission which resulted in a generally unified textual history. I mean, if you had the federal government behind one particular reading of a text and the power of the sword, that sort of uh, helps that particular reading to become predominant. Uh, the 1924 Egyptian edition, which is what is being passed across the front row there, is viewed by most as the official version in Arabic. There are other slightly different versions uh, over in India, Pakistan, uh, maybe down in Indonesia, places like that. Uh, but uh, that's what you have there. Now, <clears throat> there is a major, major difference between the centralized governmental control of the collation and transmission of the Quranic text and the non-centralized, non-controlled transmission of the New Testament. I don't have time tonight to do this, but I wish I had time uh, to share with you how we got our New Testament. Um, if you go on my website, you go to my YouTube channel, I have about 530 YouTube videos up and a couple of them include my New Testament uh, presentation on this subject. So if you want to look into that uh, or my book on the King James Only uh, controversy or scripture alone, things like that, we'll address some of these issues. But the New Testament was never controlled by any organization, edited, anything like that. It just simply exploded into the world and as a result, we have John 5, 4, and the questions concerning John 5, 4. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, the Muslim says it is, but the reality is it's not. Let me read some text for you. This, is, this portion is extremely important to understand. Please, please try to... Sometimes I, I sort of watch audiences as I read, and when I start using Arabic names, people just start... You know, checking their watches, if you still wear watches, or you, you know, you get out your iPhone, and you know, you, you know, I saw somebody down front checking their hair with their iPhone. That was pretty cool. It's, it's not a mirror, but you just turn the camera on. It. I don't do that, as you can tell, but uh, don't really have a need to, but I, it's, it's, you know, people start doing stuff. Uh, try, to, try to listen, because I think you're going to see why this is extremely important. This is from, for those of you who are interested, if we have any Muslims with us, this is Sahih al-Bakari, uh, volume 5, pages 509 and 510. Abu Bakr then said to me, Umar has come to me and said, casualties were heavy among the Qura of the Quran, those who knew the Qura by, Quran by heart on the day of the battle of Yalmama. <laughs> I have just become accustomed to the fact that I need to stop after saying Yalmama, <laughs> let the laughter roll through the audience and move on. It's just a place name. I'm not saying your mama. But I've just had to get used to it. Okay? There was a battle. This was shortly after the death of Muhammad. And there were men who had memorized, they were called the Qura, who had memorized the Quran. But many of them died that day. Okay? And notice what is being said. And I am afraid that more heavy casualties may take place among the Qura on other battlefields, whereby a large part of the Quran may be lost. 
Therefore, I suggest you, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, who is the next caliph, order that the Quran be collected. So what does this tell us? This tells us that when Muhammad died, there was no official version of the Quran. It had been memorized by people, but many of those people died in the, the Battle of Yamama. And so there is a concern that a large part of the Quran might be lost. So I started looking for the Quran and collecting it from what was written on palm stalks, thin white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart, till I found the last ver of, verse of Surat al Taba, Surat on Repentance, with Abu Khazamiya al Ansari, and I did not find it with anyone other than him. Now think about that. One of the verses he found with, in the memory of one person. One person. Keep that in mind. Then the complete manuscripts, copy of the Quran, remained with Abu Bakr till he died, then with Umar till the end of his life, then with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. Okay, so there's the first collection. Shortly after Muhammad's death, they collect stuff together from palm stocks, people's memories, and they, they, they collect it together. About 18 years later, Hudaifa was afraid of their, the people of Sham and Iraq's, differences in the recitation of the Quran. So he said to Uthman, Uthman's now the third caliph, O chief of the believers, listen to, this, listen to this interesting statement. Save this nation before they differ about the book, the Quran, as Jews and Christians did before. Hmm. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscripts of the Qurans so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and re return the manuscripts to you. And when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. This is called the Uthmanic Revision. It takes place around 650 AD, about 20 years or so after uh, Muhammad's death. And so Uthman comes up with his version and he sends those versions off to the main Islamic centers and says, this is the official version, burn everything else. Burn everything else. Now that creates a very stable text, but what's the one thing you have to absolutely be certain of? Uthman had to get it right. The problem is, who is the last prophet? Muhammad, not Uthman. Uthman's not inspired. You see, it's real nice to have someone come along and make an edited version for you, as long as they get it right. But you see, the problem is, if they don't get it right, and they destroy what they used beforehand, now you can't get past that point in the history of the text, unlike the New Testament, where we never had an Uthman. And we never had somebody come along and edit and create a final version. It's a much better situation. Ibn Abi Dawood in his book, Kitab al-Masahif, page 23 says, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after that. So the Quran was lost? Well, a Christian writing in AD 830, the Apology of Al-Kindi says, Then the people fell to variance in their readings. Some read according to the version of Ali, which they followed the present day. Some read according to the collection of which we have made mention. One party read according to the text of Ibn Masud, who was one of the companions of Muhammad. And another read of that of Ubay ibn Kab. When Uthman came to power and people everywhere differed in their reading, Ali sought grounds of accusation against him. One man would read a verse one way, another man another way, and there was change in interpolation, some copies having more and some less. When this was represented to Uthman and the danger urged of division, strife, and apostasy, he thereupon caused it to be collected together all the leaves and scraps that he could, together with the copy that was written out at first. Notice this is exactly what the Muslim sources say too, but this is a Christian. But they did not interfere with that which was in the hands of Ali or of those who followed his reading. Ubay was dead by this time. As for Ibn Masud, they demanded his exemplar, but he refused to give it up. Ubay ibn, uh, uh, ibn, Masud, ibn, ibn Masud would not give up his copy of the Quran. And textually speaking, we can find evidence of that even to this day. It is reported from Is Ismail ibn Ibrahim, I'll skip the rest of the names just to get done here. Let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran. 
How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say, I have acquired what has survived. The early generations, I don't have time to expand upon this, but the early generations of Islamic writers recognized that there were textual variations and issues in regards to the collection and transmission of the text of the Quran. Many Muslims believe the Quran has no meaningful textual history, that the Quran they possess today is a mirror image of Uthman's version, as if uh, Uthman just put it on a photocopier and passed it on to us today. But the fact is that there are textual variants in the early copies of the Quran and evidence of an early editing process seeking to remove Ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Qab's influence, and here is where I will show you those very things. And that looks just like that there. Here is Surah 3158. Here is a variant that is found there. Here is the text under consideration which speaks of Allah surely gathering those who die to himself. Here is the same text from the Quranic manuscript 328 found in the National Library of France in Paris is dated to around a hundred years after Hijra, so within the first hundred years of the history of the Quran. Just as reading Hijazi text is hard even for those who read modern Arabic text, let's expand it, make it a little bit larger. Now what you can see is that the Paris manuscript has an extra olive not found in the modern printed Quranic text. But in this case, that extra olive completely changes the meaning. In the ancient text, it says those who die will not be gathered to a law, while the modern 1924 printed text says they will surely be gathered to a law. Now please make sure you understand why I point this out. I'm not saying we can't figure out the original reading. I'm pointing out how important it is to have a full, unedited, widely dispersed manuscript tradition with which to make such determinations. And you will notice, I could turn to this page in the Quran for you, if it's wherever it is, somewhere, probably back here, somewhere. And you won't find a, a footnote that tells you that there's a variant. We have it at John 5, 3. Here's a variant. You just won't find a critical edition of the Quran that tells you that. Which would you rather have? Would you rather know about John 5, 4? Or would you rather just not know about John 5, 4? Truth-loving people want to know the history of their text. Let me show you some more. There's the will surely and will not. There you have the actual... Uh, and by the way, uh, I'm not pulling this off the web someplace by God's grace um, and the support of God's people. Uh, this is a photocopy from the museum quality copy I have of the Paris Quran. When it's open, it's this wide and that tall. And there's about two or three sets of those in the United States. I have one of them. They're about $1,400 a piece. Uh, so I made these photocopies myself uh, of where the variants are. Now regarding uh, Surah 1793, Abd al-Razak mentions a tradition from Mujahid. We did not know what a house of ornament Zukruf was until we saw in the Qara of Ibn Masud a house of gold. And the fact is there were competing readings in the earliest centuries, the transmission of the Quran, specifically the tradition of Ibn Masud, as well as that of Ubay ibn Qab, persisted in the earliest manuscripts long after Uthman attempted to enforce a particular set of readings. This can be seen in Surah 1793. There is the text, as you would see it in that Quran that's going around right now. There's the blow-up of the text. The current reading found in the Uthmanian version of the current 1924 Egyptian, speaks of a house of ornament, Zukruf, while Ibn Masud has a house of gold, the Hab. Now once again, without the materials destroyed by Uthman, how does one logically and truthfully determine which is the correct reading? Once you make a revision, once you destroy those things, how can you know? We can go back to earlier and earlier manuscripts, but if you destroy all that stuff, how can you know? There's a difference between the two. And this is one of the most interesting ones. Surah 2, 222 provides another example, this time based upon Fogg's palimpsest manuscript. If you get anything tonight, you're going to be able to get home and amaze your friends and family that you know what a palimpsest is. <laughs> hey, what did you do tonight? I found out what a palimpsest is. A palimpsest is a manuscript where you've had one book written on it. Remember, these are animal skins, so they can be washed off. 
And so you've washed the ink off of the previous book and you've put something else on top of it. I mean, not many of us have too many cows in the backyard. We can go out and kill just to have some extra writing paper. So you wanted to reuse this kind of stuff. So a palimpsest is where by using infrared or ultraviolet light, you're able to go back and read what was originally written because when you would write with a, a quill or something, you would actually scratch the surface. So you can actually go back and read what was written originally underneath these things. The Fogg's Palimpsest Manuscript is a manuscript of an early version of the Quran uh, that represents the perspective of Ibn Masud. And so what you can see here, when we read the original text in Fogg's, Fogg's Pal Manuscript of Surah 2, 222, which I hear here on the top, and compare the current edition, we see not just variation, we see wholesale editing. Words are changed, the word order is changed, verbal forms are altered, grammatical terminations are changed, etc. This is clear evidence of the continued attempt, at least a century after Uthman, of ridding the Quran of the readings of Ibn Masud. Now, that may just look like a bunch of scribbles to you, but anyone who can read Arabic knows that while those two lines have very similar meanings, they have been edited. There has been a purposeful editing and changing that has taken place here in this material. This is why Sufyan al fawris relatively short tafsir, for instance, we're almost done, can list 67 variant readings, 24 of which are attributed Ibn Masud. What is that? That's one of the early tafsirs. It's a commentary on the Quran. And in those early years, they didn't have any problem talking about, well, some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that. Wow, that would be unheard of today. I mean, the vast majority of Muslims you talk to do not know that there are differences. Now, the existence of these textual issues has been well known to Muslim scholars for centuries, but has fallen out of general Islamic recognition, especially in our lifetimes. And here's a good example. Here is just one page of many to be found in the 2007 Turkish publication of the top copy manuscript, listing variations between the major early chronic manuscripts. These lists are produced by Islamic scholars, not Orientalists and not Christians. Now, that's not a completely critical text, but that's, again, from my library. I got the cheapy version. The expensive version was 5,000 bucks. Couldn't quite afford that. So I've got the $250 version. Um, but there are a number of pages of these graphs from Muslims documenting these variations in these major manuscripts of the Quran. How many of the Muslims today know this? Very, very, very few. So, that gives you some background on the history of, of Muhammad, on the Quran, its, its history, some in-depth stuff you probably weren't expecting tonight, but now you've seen it. You can at least say, I saw it with my own two eyes. But I haven't even started on the theology, because that's tomorrow night. But that gives you the background, where this is coming from, where the Quran's coming from, what they believe about the Quran, and at least give us a foundation so tomorrow night when I start talking about the five pillars, the six fundamental beliefs, what the Shahada is, what the prayers are, the five daily prayers, uh, why some people in some places in the world get up at uh, three something in the morning during the, during the um, uh, summer uh, to say, to say their, their daily prayers, what Hajj is, what the Quran says about Jesus what the relationship between Islam and Christians are. You've now got a basis. Normally, I just have to sort of throw it in as side comments, but it's going to be very nice to be able to have all that as a foundation. I think as a result, you'll understand things a whole lot better.
Thank you, Dr. White. Would I be correct that uh, Muslims believe or would hold that Christians who hold to the Orthodox uh, belief in the Trinity would be guilty of shirk by definition? Uh, let me clarify two things. Um, in most of my comments this evening, if there are any Muslims here, in most of my comments this evening, I will be addressing Orthodox Sunni beliefs. Um, I am obviously familiar with Shiism, but, but the, the Shiite sect of Islam only represents about 10% of the world's population. Uh, about 85% uh, is Sunni. There's some other groups out there, but Sunni Shia is the, is the major split. And so I'll be looking primarily at an Orthodox Sunni perspective. Um, and of course, my main exposure is to conservative Sunni uh, Islam. Uh, many of my apologist friends would identify themselves as Salafi or Wahhabi. Uh, they would be very familiar with the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah. And if you, any of this is not making any sense to you, I'm trying to say this for my Muslim friends who might be here, so you would have an idea of who I'm normally dialoguing with. I realize those are not the only perspectives out there. At this very point, it's a very interesting situation that you, the reason you would ask that question, I, uh, I have a book due at the end of the year, whether I'm going to get it done or not, you can all pray for me, um, for Bethany House Publishers on the subject of Islam. And then in the spring of next year, I am to be co-authoring a book with a Muslim on the Trinity and Tawheed. Tawheed is the Islamic belief in the oneness of Allah. It is the primary opposition to our belief in the doctrine of the Trinity. The original person that I asked to co-author that book with me um, is a man by the name of Sheikh Yasser Khadi. And I have listened to many hours of Sheikh Khadi's lectures. Um, he is American, so he's very easy to understand. His Arabic is wonderful, which has helped me as I study mine. Um, he came that close to doing it. His answer would have been an unqualified yes. That is, that from the perspective of the Hadith and especially uh, men like Ibn Taymiyyah, which are considered very conservative interpreters of the Sunnah and the Sharia, uh, that the... And, and to me, I, I have a hard time seeing how you can read the Quran in any other way. And so far, everyone I've debated would have agreed with this as well that according to, and we're going to see this tomorrow night, so I'm just going to very briefly sketch it for you right now. But according to the Quran, to worship Jesus Christ is to commit an act of shirk. Because from the Islamic perspective, Jesus is a creature created by Allah. And even though we say we believe that there is one God, and we say that we are worshiping one God, and that the Father, Son, and Spirit fully share completely the one being that is God, there is no division of the being of God, etc., etc., um, that from the Islamic perspective, <clears throat> that is association, and hence makes us mushrik, mushrikim, and therefore uh, the fire will be our abode. And Surah 4 and Surah 5 are very clear, I think. Uh, do not say three. There will be a severe punishment upon anyone who says three. Now, the Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran actually says, do not say Trinity. The term Trinity does not appear in the Arabic Quran. That is an interpretation on the part of Yusuf Ali. The best translation is three. Three what? The Quran is saying we believe in three gods. Um, if you'd like to hear a very full discussion of that, uh, in February of this year, I had the privilege of debating Bassam Zawadi in London at Trinity Road Chapel in Wandsworth, and um, our whole, the, the debate thesis was, does the Quran misrepresent Christianity? And it was on the subject, does the Quran even accurately represent the doctrine of the Trinity, which we'll be talking about tomorrow evening. But in a debate format, you can hear the other side. And the irony is, what you can hear in that debate, and I'm, I'm hoping we have the MP3s up, I know that we've provided them, but, um, Fundamentally, at the end of the debate, I was arguing that the Quran is clear enough to interpret on this matter, and the Muslim was saying it wasn't. So I was, I was arguing for Quranic clarity, and the Muslim was, was arguing against it. It was very, very interesting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't believe nobody else is up here. I, I want to hang out with you for a week and ask questions, but I'll keep it to two short questions. Um, one, 
you explained to us how difficult it is to understand the Quran and Islam as a result of that. Is there a single resource that you think is, is a good resource for Christians like ourselves who would like to learn more about Islam and um, the Christian You mean a other, other than my book when it comes out next year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there something that you recommend yeah. that would be a good resource for us? Single resource? Um, uh, a couple things. Um, there is a book uh, by Martin Elas published by Zondervan called Understanding the Quran. They spell it K-O-R-A-N. I always spell it Q-U-R-A-N. Um, and that is what I use in my classes right now until, okay. until I put mine on. It's, it's, it's not a big book, um, but it, it's, it's very insightful, and I think that's, that's very useful. Um, if you're going to read the Quran, and I would not, you know, you know people say, oh, I, 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 I don't know. I've, uh, I've read the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants for Bill Great Price, and it has been one of the greatest advantages I've had in witnessing the Mormons because I know their scriptures and I've taken the time to study their scriptures. Um, and a, a, now, as I've explained before, a Muslim would not say that I've actually read the Quran because I have not read all the Quran in Arabic. That means the majority of Muslims have never read the Quran either mm -hmm. because the vast majority of Muslims have never read the Quran in Arabic. Uh, even though they may do their prayers in Arabic and they may quote portions of the Quran in Arabic, they don't even know what they're saying. Um, but there, there are certain versions of the Quran that are helpful. The Yusuf Ali translation normally has footnotes, it gives you background, sort of an introduction to, the, to each of the surahs, footnotes at the bottom. We will disagree with some of the renderings and the footnotes and things like that, but that's there. And I just recently got a book called A Journey Through the Quran that's about that thick, which provides a massive amount of background information, uh, which is extremely useful. I'm listening to that as I'm writing. Um, and those are available on, uh, on, uh, on Amazon as well. Um, but then there's a website uh, called Answering Islam, uh, answering-islam. Um, and huge amounts of information, just mountains of information there, um, going really, really in depth, and, and a really good search engine too, that uh, can be very useful to you. But I start with Elas, uh, Martini Elas's book, and um, uh, then there's another book that R.C. Sproul co-wrote with um, <laughs> uh, Abdul Salib. That's what we call him. Uh, Abdul Salib is a pseudonym. Abdul Salib means servant of the cross. And uh, I know who Abdul Salib is, but his secret is safe with me. Uh, but um, uh, it would be another uh, good book that I think is available from Ligonier, if I recall correctly. Okay, thank you. And um, the second question is you mentioned multiple debates that you participated in with Muslims. Mm -hmm. Um, would you share with us, have, have you ever convinced them that, that, um, <laughs> that they should convert? Or have you actually seen conversions as a result of yeah. attending the debates? Um, the person that I am debating is normally a, an imam or a representative of Islam. And while I certainly, for example, um, uh, if you... If you get on my website, you'll be able to uh, listen to the um, audio from the debate from a week ago with Abdullah Kunda. And I closed that debate by talking about the fact that I, uh, Abdullah Kunda asked me a question, it was the last cross-examination question he asked me. He said, why has God made it so difficult for someone like me to believe what you're saying? Because I was talking about the incarnation of Jesus. Ask yourself a question. How would you answer a Muslim who asked, asked you that question? And one of my, part, of, part of my answer was that, um, that I pray for Abdullah Kunda. And so in my closing statement, I want to expand upon that because some Muslims can find that to be somewhat um, either arrogant or condescending. And I want to explain I'm a sinner saved by grace. When I say I pray for Abdullah Kunda, I, I do pray for that young man. Um, and a couple of these men that I, that I debate, um, I really sense that they're listening to what I'm saying, and I, I pray. It, it, it's only the work of the grace of God, the Spirit of God, revealing Jesus to someone that can cause them to, to flee to him, to see their own sin, to see him as a perfect Savior. And so um, I do know of situations where 
I was contacted by a church. They had, uh, they had showed the uh, Shabir Ali debates at a church, and there were two young Muslim men that, uh, that attended. And as a result of that showing and the witnessing of those people, uh, those young uh, Muslim men confessed faith in Christ and were baptized. But the men who, the men who I'm debating, um, that would be a very long and difficult journey for them. And I continue to pray for them. I do debates primarily for the audience that's there that evening and for the people who will be watching. Um, the person that I'm debating, I would love to see any one of them, no matter how nasty some of them can be, and some of them are. I would love to see any one of them saved, but that's not my primary goal that evening. My goal that evening is to clearly present the truth of whatever it is we're discussing as it relates to the gospel and to get a recording of it so that, that can then go to places I can never go. It's amazing now that YouTube exists. Um, we get so many hits to our website now from Indonesia, which is the most Muslim area in the world. I hope you all realize that the vast majority of Muslims are not Arabic. Only about 19, 16 to 19 percent of the world's Muslims are Arabic. Uh, the largest Muslim uh, nation in the world, population-wise, Indonesia. And um, those videos are going places we can't go, so it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yes, sir. Very good. Before we continue, um, we wanted to... Uh uh, we wanted to put this on at no charge because um, we didn't want someone to say well they couldn't afford to come but also there are expenses related to that so we're just going to pass around for a love offering for Dr. White and his ministry <coughs> and um, if you um, if you some of you have already donated but uh, just to collect some uh, love offering for him and um, we'll continue with the questions you, you ready? Um, I was me and my friends, I was at aftercare at school, and we were talking about Muslims and like, and we were saying like, oh yeah, they hate Christians and they say to kill all of them and things. And my teacher, Mrs. DeFaro, said that, um, no, that's not true because um, because they have like terrorist groups that are Muslim, like Taliban and that go and they like take the Muslim religion and they make it like bad and make it seem twisted. Like what kind of Quran would they have? Huh. Well, let me see if I can make this understandable for everybody. There are Muslims in the world who hate us because we're Christians and they feel that that is what God would have them to do. Uh, you already mentioned one of the groups called the Taliban in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And many of these, some of these men really do believe that what they're doing is commanded by their God, by their scriptures, by the example of Muhammad. Some of these men just do this because they're evil, and religion's a good reason to, a good, a good cover. There are people who have committed horrible atrocities in the name of Jesus. There are people who call themselves Christians who uh, shelled uh, Muslims with artillery because they claimed they were Christians. Now we find a fundamental contradiction between the teachings of Jesus and doing that kind of thing. Uh, but these Muslim men find consistency in the examples of Muhammad. They all have the same Quran. The problem is the Quran has to be interpreted. And there are these other sources that are used to interpret it. And what's, what, what worries me, to be honest with you, is that I know Muslims who don't want to kill me and who would never kill me. Um, and they will argue against the people who want to kill me. But here's my concern. I'm glad they're there. I have good conversations with them. We're not brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not brothers and sisters in faith. And I pray for them and I want to witness to them and tell them about who Jesus is. But we can have good conversations and they're not going to try to kill me. But when they have their debates with the Taliban, when they debate these people who believe that they should hate us, they have to go to these sources. And I've, yeah, you may have heard me mention one of these sources called the Hadith. These are traditions going back to Muhammad. 
And the problem is, they get to interpret them in different ways. And so I wish them well in their debates. Some people call them the moderates. Even Sheikh Yasser Qadi, even though he is a very conservative man, he argues against these people who are engaging in jihad because he says there is no one who right now can, can proclaim a state of jihad called a caliph. A caliph is the head of all the Muslims in the world. There isn't just one of them right now. My concern is I appreciate that they, they write against these men and they, they try to argue and, and things like that, but the sources they're drawing from, I've come to the conclusion, are not consistent enough and clear enough for them to really win the battle one way or the other. And so as long as there are people who want to engage in that kind of activity and they, 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 they want to cause terror in the hearts of others and they want to persecute Christians, they're going to continue doing so unless God changes their hearts. Because I just don't see that the sources themselves are consistent enough for one side to be completely victorious over the other. You can make an argument uh, from the non-jihad side, but it's, it's you pick your sources, I pick my sources. Uh, the man that, did you hear about what happened in, in Yemen two weeks ago where a, a U.S. drone killed Anwar al-Awlaki? Did you, did you hear about that in school? Well, a, a U.S. drone attack craft killed an American citizen by the name of Anwar al-Awlaki. And after 9-11, Anwar al had condemned what those terrorists did. Within a few years, he had fled to Yemen and he was praising what those terrorists did. So he changed his views, mainly by being argued from the sources of Hadith and the histo history of, of Muhammad's life. And he ended up being someone that was a, a, a big enemy of the United States, so much so that, that, that he was killed in Yemen. So it's not a different Quran. It's the different ways of interpreting the Quran and the sources they use that results in these big differences. Does that help? Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, what? brother uh, from the ministry that I support as well. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. White, in your many debates with Muslims, have you ever had the opportunity to find out uh, in your debates what is in it for the Muslim women <laughs> in their version of paradise? That's funny. My wife asked me the same question. Uh, <laughs> and I, I can count on one hand with four fingers left over the number of conversations I've had with Muslim women on the subject. Honestly, ladies, if you want to know a huge mission field, um, that's where it would be. I, I will not get the opportunity to have those kinds of conversations. Muslim women, by and large, really uh, would find any kind of conversation with a Christian man to be uh, next to impossible. But you'd have the opportunity. If Muslim women are going to hear about Jesus, ladies, you're the ones that are going to bring the message. Because of the cultural fear of communication with a, a man who's not your husband or not related to you, period, let alone a Christian. Why, in light of the very patriarchal form of Islam and, and its view of paradise, are women attracted to it? Tomorrow night, I will show you, as part of my presentation, people in Sydney, Australia, a few years ago, becoming Muslims. And most of them are women. And they're Western women. What attracted them? The message of monotheism. The message of monotheism. You say, but wait a minute. Didn't they get that in Christianity? Um, evidently, they got entertainment in Christianity. They didn't get a focus upon the worship of the one true God, which is such a shame, because that's what we believe. In fact, we believed that before they did. But we'll talk about that tomorrow night. In regards to uh, Ishmael, uh, a lot of guys I talked to, a lot of Muslim guys I talked to said that Ishmael was the father of the Muslims. Yeah. And in regards to the Old Testament, where God 
promising that he would make Ishmael into a great nation. Yeah. How, how would you uh, discuss that with a Muslim when they, <coughs> when they bring that forth to you, the, the promises that God makes to Ishmael? Well, this is where you have to, you have to try to reason with someone to cause them to seek to be consistent. Um, I, I developed a phrase in my debate with Shabir Ali in 2006, inconsistency is the sign of a failed argument. If they're going to the Old Testament, which they call the Torah, to pick these texts out about Ishmael, why don't they allow the other texts that exist in the same book, sometimes in the same chapter, that specifically say, but the promise isn't to Ishmael, it's to Isaac, why don't they let that stand as well? They don't. It's sort of like, and this is something that is fascinating, but I'm not going to have time to cover it. How many of you were aware of the fact that the Quran says that our Bibles prophesy the coming of Muhammad? Not many of you. How many of you are aware of the fact that most Mormons think that the parakletos, the paraclete, the helper of John 14 and 16 is Muhammad, not the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 18, a prophet who is to come, which according to Peter is fulfilled in Jesus. That's Muhammad. I've heard Muslims apply Isaiah 9, 6 to Muhammad. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's Muhammad. So, the amazing thing to me is they'll allow those texts to stand, the text about Ishmael to stand, but then we show them texts about the deity of Christ, the cross, the resurrection, Isaac's the fulfillment of the promise, all the rest of that stuff, oh, that's all been changed. There's no consistency. And there's really no reasoning with someone at that level until you say to them, look, you have to use the same standard in presenting Islam to me that you use in defending the Quran and I promise to you I will use the same standards in criticizing Islam that I use in defending my Christian faith. Now that may mean some work on both your part and my part but, you've, but until they are, 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 are encouraged to have that kind of view of truth you'll always be on the, the wrong side of the argument because it doesn't matter what you say there's an overriding argument that's determining what the conclusions are for them. Now historically, there just isn't any evidence that Ishmael was the one with Abraham who founded the Kaaba. And even though the Quran doesn't specifically say that it was Ishmael offered by Abraham, most Muslims think that it was. But again, that's coming, what? Uh, 2100 years after the events and can claim no historical lineage back to the time period that the Old Testament does at all. So, but you have to have a, a, an even standard upon which to even begin to have the discussion or it's just, it just goes in circles all the time. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thanks. Just to, uh, you want to just do these last two and then, because uh, I, see, I see folks leaving. Bye. 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 Good night. Oh, they're waving back. Bye. <laughs> okay, you mentioned that the Muslims believe that uh, the Quran is a, are the direct words of God, not yes. of men. Uh, then, and uh, they had the. Now, could I, could, I, could I correct one thing then? Just add one thing. That's not to say that the, the Quran does not quote other people. For example, one of the most fascinating elements of the Quran to me is the fact that it, it more than once recounts the conversation between Allah and Iblis, which we would call Satan, uh, uh, because Iblis fell because he refused to worship Adam. He refused to bow down before Adam. And so it quotes Iblis as he speaks. Interestingly enough, it quotes him in different ways. You have to harmonize the accounts. But the point is, it will quote those people, but it's the giving of it which is all completely, none of it comes from Muhammad's understanding or there's no interpretation on the part of Muhammad or anything like that at all. Okay? Just want to make sure you all understood that. It's not just a long speech of a law from beginning to end. Okay, so then the Uthmanic revision, which is the official version because they burnt the rest of the record, so to speak, right. would be the record supposedly of what God's words are according to the Muslims. Right. And then we had Fogg's palm cest, 
Palm, Paul? Fogg's Palimpsest Manuscripts. Palimpsest Manuscripts, which really basically shows a whole lot of wholesale editing, correct? Which, which existed outside of the Uthmanic line, and Uthman was trying to get rid of that stuff, yes. Okay, I think you showed us maybe a little partial list of maybe a number of edits. Yes. Okay, yes. so for two questions. How many of, of those edits are, are there, and why don't the Muslims know about these edits, which really wouldn't be the word of God? Um, why don't they know? Because um, even there is no, and I can't do this this way. Um, let, let me show you something real quick. This will illustrate things for you, okay? Um, let me go to... Uh, how many of you have a Bible program on your, even on your smartphone tonight? I do. A bunch of people, okay? Uh, there are some great uh, ones out there like Accordance, Logos, Bible Works, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. And here is... This is very difficult to do while you're kneeling down like this and looking backwards, but hey... Uh, let's look, let's, let, me, let me show you something here. There is the Accordance Bible software at Mark 12, 32. And this shows you uh, the Greek text. The NA27 apparatus shows you textual variants. This is the CNTTS apparatus down here at the bottom. We provide a fully critical text of both the Old and New Testament. I could bring up the Hebrew material that would show you the same thing. And this is available for anybody. You don't have to have a secret, I'm a super Christian card to get it, anything like that, okay? Anybody can get this. Where's the Quran right now? How far has it gotten so far? Or we might make it if we hurry up. Um, there are no notes in there. So if that's all you've ever seen, and I come along and say there's variants, you're going to look at me like I landed from outer space. Now, I mentioned, I showed you the top copy manuscript where, where there are Turkish scholars who tend to be a little bit more secular who are aware of these variants, but that's just not a part of the general interest of the average Muslim at all, nor is the, nor is the information there. There's also no critical edition to be purchased anyhow. There is a work going on, it's called the Corpus Quranicum, which will eventually, we hope, lead to a critical edition of the Quran. But the primary force behind that is, is not conservative. That ain't coming out of Egypt. That's primarily Western scholars that are doing that. And the research into these things in the modern, in the past 300 years, has been almost all from Western non-Muslim scholars, which makes Muslims uneasy and suspicious as well. And so if your overarching theology is, we have a perfect book, why should you be looking for variants anyways? For many Muslims, the very existence of those variants is extremely problematic. Just as, well, let's face it, we know King James only folks, and they don't like that there's any, they don't even, they, they get mad at me when I point out there's differences between the various printings of the King James. So we understand that mindset, but this is a mindset that is much even, even more widely uh, distributed, shall we say. And the number, how many? That's just it. We have no way of knowing because the study of, of, of the Quran in comparison to the New Testament is in its infancy. There, there isn't even a full listing of all the Quranic manuscripts by which you could start to, to put that kind of material together. No textual and one of the things that worries me is that, for example, a palimpsest manuscript went through an auction house in London about two years ago. Nobody knows who bought it and it disappeared. It may have been extremely valuable for identifying these very things, but uh, Western universities don't have Saudi oil money to get that kind of stuff. Will we ever see it? Who knows? Who knows? The last question of the evening. Um, I've heard that some Muslims in this country are pushing for the establishment of Sharia law in the courts of our country. And so I was just wondering, at least pertaining to Muslims, I was wondering if that's possible, and if so, what the implications for our nation 
would be. When you say if that's possible, you mean that, that, they, would, that they would desire that or that they could do that? That they could actually accomplish, it? accomplish that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 let, let, let's, let's keep something in mind. When uh, President Obama went over to Egypt and uh, said that we had nine million Muslims in the United States, his CIA was left going, really? Our official number is 2.9. <laughs> How do we do that? Um, uh, the, 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 the Muslim organizations love to exaggerate the number of, of Muslims in the United States. There's, there's about three million, somewhere around that number. Um, and so I, I really don't think that the religious perspective of three million people is going to become um, law uh, in the United States, nor could it from a constitutional perspective. But what we do need to understand is why would a Muslim, a Muslim would look at you and say, why do you, as a Christian, think it would be wrong for me to desire to see that? Don't you want the laws of your nation to reflect God's will for mankind? In other words, wouldn't you say that the closer your laws are to the will of God revealed in the Christian scriptures, the more God is going to bless your nation? I mean, the Old Testament law, the prophets, minor prophets especially, constantly talk about justice for the poor, caring for the widows and the orphans. If our law pursues those people and hounds those people and doesn't give justice to those people, should we expect God to, to bless that? Of course not. So the Muslim looks at us and says, you want men to behave in light of how God has revealed they should behave in your scriptures. That's all we want. That's all we want. So you need to understand that's the mindset. And if there's just a knee-jerk reaction, oh, but that's terrible because Sharia means cutting people's hands off. Well, in some places it does. Sharia means women can't, can't be educated and things like that. In some places, that's exactly what it means. But from the Muslim perspective, if that's how God has revealed things to be, look, the secularist looks at you and says, wait a minute, your, your Bible says that the, husband, the, 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 the wife is to be in subjection to the husband? That's terrible. That's horrible. Your, your Bible says homosexuality is wrong? Oh, how regressive. That's terrible. You see, sometimes we fight the wrong battles. What the Muslim needs to hear is, I understand you believe that Sharia is revealed by God. The problem is your Sharia came after my revelation of the final word from God, Jesus Christ. Let's talk about that. We always need to bring it back to the gospel. But sometimes we respond sort of the way the secularists do, and we're inconsistent in so doing. I mean, Osama bin Laden, and I, you know, I've heard all the stuff about what he had on his computer and stuff, and I don't know, I wasn't there. But basically, Osama bin Laden's view was, Allah is the creator of all things. Allah has given his law. Men will never be happy unless they live in accordance with Allah's law. Allah's law must be spread across the world, and this is how to do it. We believe that God's the creator of all men and women. No men and women can ever be truly happy unless they know their creator and function as he has designed them to function. And that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now what's the difference? Because we believe that the bowing of the knee that brings salvation has to be something that comes from in here. It's the work of the Spirit of God taking out that heart of stone, giving us a heart of flesh. Unfortunately, that religious conviction of Islam is intimately wedded with a political and cultural system. One last thing, and then we close. I'll let Eddie close us in prayer, however you want to do it. I remember, uh, I don't know, 2003, 2004, somewhere, somewhere around there, there were some Fox News reporters who were kidnapped by some Muslims. And they released a video of those Fox News reporters converting to Islam. Basically, at the end of an AK-47. <laughs> and 
to convert to Islam, you have to say La ilaha illallah, wa Muhammad Rasulullah. You have to say the Shahada, and they did it on video. Now, in the West, we watched that and went, "How stupid do these people think that we are? Do you really think those reporters, after they were released, and they were released, thankfully, do you really expect them to continue to be Muslims?" Do you, do you really that's how you convert people? Is convert. Oh, sure. <laughs> so we're like, Pfft. but from the other side, the Muslims, they're looking at the same thing. And they're laughing too. Because they're going, Pfft. look at us Christians. They'll give in at anything. You see, they look at them. I was debating. Um, Sheikh Jalal Abu al -Rub in California a few years ago. And one of his arguments during our debate was Christianity invaded Iraq. They see this as a Christian nation, including Hollywood and all that it does. <laughs> and we're all sitting here going, whoa, no, I don't think so. But from their perspective, so they see these guys, they come from a Christian nation, but they're willing to go, uh, Muslim, sure, don't shoot me. And from their perspective, what they're seeing is the weakness of the Christian nation. And you see, both sides end up chuckling and not really realizing what the other side is seeing in that one event. And my concern is, much of what we see on the television today, that's exactly what happens. We, we're not really understanding what is going on. Hopefully, we've got a little better basis starting tonight, and then we'll really rev it up and, and finish it out tomorrow evening. Eddie? Very good. Let's give a round of applause. For you.